Welcome friend, Dr. Wiedenfeld here. I'm in the weeds trying to understand Plato's Republic. So let me give you some background on the text and then I'm going to start talking about what it has to say on poetry or storytelling, which relates to film. Um, <clears throat> so Plato's Republic, and I'm working off the Wakefield translation uh, from 1993, is um, a book about morality and governance, just the same way that I described the Analects of Confucius, uh, written a little bit later, 375 BCE. And <clears throat> uh, it talks about uh, stories and poetry and the arts uh, as they relate to morality and governance. Um, <clears throat> So Plato is part of the classical era of Greek history, which was from about 510 to 323. Um, he was a student of Socrates, and here you see the uh, Jacques-Louis David painting of the death of Socrates in 399. Uh, famous, uh, famous death, which, which I won't get into, but uh, so, so Plato came afterward, and apparently after Socrates died, uh, you know, the life of the of uh, the philosopher didn't seem to be too well regarded in Athens. Uh, so, being a nobleman, he uh, first went around and traveled a bit uh, around the Mediterranean, uh, which you may recognize in this map. Which I like it uh, instead of uh, north south, uh, kind of you know, we have east at the bottom and west at the west of the top, uh, because you can get a sense for how his travels to Egypt, Sicily, um, is not crossing any sort of major continental racial border here between Africa, Europe, and Asia. Uh, when, when it actually comes down to the geography of the Mediterranean, they're all very close. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you know, some have read, uh, Egyptian ideas in Plato's Republic from the caste system uh, to, you know, the philosopher king as, uh, you know, the pharaoh or the, you know, noble priests in the Egyptian tradition. Uh, and more broadly, um, we can think about Greek culture as taking on certain influences from Persian culture, uh, Egyptian culture, Southwest Asia, or Middle Eastern cultures in general. Um, so after, after Plato travels around, he comes back to Athens and founds the Academy, as it's called, uh, in the 380s. And here is a picture, not from that time, but uh, from the Renaissance, Raphael, in Italy, in the Vatican. And uh, there in the center, you have Plato and his most famous pupil, who is Aristotle. Renaissance representation of them. Um, <clears throat> so on the bottom right, of course, it's in the Italian Renaissance that Plato and Aristotle, you know, take on important fame uh, in the kind of Latin speaking world. But even before that, uh, they had, and, and because of the Islamic golden age uh, that read all of these Greek texts, um, from Byzantium and elsewhere and translated them into Arabic. Uh, and so they have a depiction there of uh, Socrates uh, and some students. Um, now, Aristotle was, was in the Islamic Golden Age uh, in, and in the uh, European um, Middle Ages would have been more influential than Plato. But uh, when Plato then comes along uh, to be translated, becomes quite important as kind of neo-Platonist neo um, thought in, in this case, Florence. Uh, so the, the Italian Renaissance there is, they refounded, you know, of the Platonic Academy, uh, becomes a certain kind of basis for the European university, university system. And this text, like the Analects of Confucius, is conversations or dialogues. Um, it's told in a dramatic form where you have Socrates, uh, 
who was, of course, Plato's teacher, talking to a number of interlocutors, some of them students, uh, some of them um, other thinkers who he's going to disagree with. So that was some background on uh, the Plato and this text. Uh, so for this, this lecture, I'm going to focus on what's chapter four in the Wake uh, Waterfield translation, which he calls Primary Education for the Guardians. It's a part of book three in, uh, sometimes it's broken up into 10 books uh, from a 1578 Geneva edition. So <clears throat> where stories come into the picture in trying to think about morality is that he's looking at the education for children to be moral adults. And you'll see here in, uh, in the middle of the middle of the page there, this is, there's 377A on the right. Um, you go f a little bit further down. Now, do you appreciate that the most important stage of any enterprise is the beginning, especially when something young and sensitive is involved? And it absorbs every impression that anyone wants to stamp upon it. This is what Socrates says. And Adimantus, his interlocutor, says, well, you're absolutely right. Shall we then casually allow our children to listen to any old stories made up by just anyone and take into their minds views which, on the whole, contradict those uh, we'll want them to have as adults? No, we won't allow that at all. Uh, so our first job, apparently, is to oversee the work of the story writers. This could be read as an argument for censorship, in a way, uh, or at least censoring what children are reading. Uh, be and why does it have to be censored? Because these children are so impressionable uh, that they're going to absorb whatever is taken upon them. And so it becomes important uh, to uh, protect, uh, you know, protect their impressionable minds from bad impressions. Okay, so what kinds of things are they going to censor? Uh, there's a, a couple different points here. First, he comes out, he comes out hot, you know, who's more famous in Greek poetry than Homer? Nobody. And here comes Socrates just letting them have it. You know, Hesiod and Homer, uh, they have some defects. Whoa, quite a critic here, Socrates, have some defects. And what are the defects? Uh, you'll see uh, 377C there, or E using the written word to give a distorted image of the nature of, God, of the gods and heroes, just as a painter might produce a portrait which completely fails to capture the likeness of the original. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that, okay, so he's saying that the gods and the heroes have not been accurately represented. Why is that a problem? Well, yeah, if we skip down a little bit here, he says, we must censor them in our community, community, Adimantus. Uh, no young person is to hear stories which suggest that were he to commit the vilest of crimes and were he to do this, to do his utmost to punish his father's crimes, he wouldn't be doing anything out of the ordinary. He would be simply behaving like the first and the greatest gods. So the problem with Homer and Hesiod is that they've shown the, the gods being criminal, doing bad things. Uh, and this is a problem. Because of their status as gods and heroes, they are models for good conduct in Socrates' mind. So any depictions of the gods and their behavior should be ideal. If these are going to be good characters, and they should be good characters, this will help give a good impression uh, to the children so that they have uh, something to model their behavior on. 
um, <clears throat> then you know the story the storyteller should be censored to make sure that that the characters that they're showing for the gods and the heroes are good that they're doing good things um, and and then the children will imitate them so this seems quite logical in the way that he puts puts it together all right so that's that's one one thing to censor is the character of the gods in general uh, he makes an appeal to moderation that extreme emotions are bad this is going to come up up uh, later in uh, the republic as well that And, and here's the reason why uh, you can you can read here in the uh, second full paragraph. Um, well, this, he's talking about the kinds of stories uh, I should hear about the gods from childhood. Uh, talking about the kids. What about if they are to be brave? The children the, that they're form, forming to be guardians, which guardians are like soldiers or administrators. Uh, they're the leaders in this um in in this ideal society that they're imagining uh yeah they want them to be brave wouldn't they also need stories which are designed to make them fear death as little as possible i mean don't you think that courage and fearing death are mutually exclu exclusive yes i certainly do um <clears throat> so we don't want to have stories that are going to instill too much fear in the children who are reading them, uh, especially fear of death. So we don't want any, any depictions of the afterlife of Hades that are going to be painful, that are going to be bad, because then, uh, you know, the soldiers are not going to want to fight. They're going to be afraid of dying. They're not going to be courageous. So we're going to have good pictures of the afterlife. And uh, there are other aspects of emotion that he, that I'm, I'm not going to quote, but he, he also talks about... Uh, uh, lamentation. Uh, basically, we don't want too much crying. Uh, we don't want crying boys, crying. Uh, well, it's going to be crying women as well, because the guardians are also are also women. Um, too much sadness, uh, nor even too much laughter. Don't want too much laughter. People to be overcome by laughter. They're going to lose their heads. No, it's all about moderation. Uh, this kind of harmony of emotions that are that are all under control um, temptations then need to be resisted so not too much pleasure in laughter uh, or in sex uh, which comes up which comes up later uh, in terms of his kind of or food uh, and, his, and his, the physical aspect of this education uh, no it's going to be you know resisting those temptations uh, everything's going to be about moderation um, one other aspect to this kind of related is uh, that there should be respect for authority that is represented in the characters. So, you know, good characters should be, um, you know, respectful of the rulers, of, of the gods, of the people who are in charge. And <clears throat> this is an aspect of control as well that, uh, you know, in, individuals understand their role in, in the whole. This is this is the rationality of it. And and so they're not going to be too overcome by their um, uh, particular desires and but going to do what's best for everyone. Uh, and they're not going to lie. There's one little exception that he gives about kind of a ruler who can lie to the people if there's a threat to them. Uh, so it's, an, you know, it's kind of a noble lie that's doing them good. Uh, but, you know, that one exception aside, we want to have honest, honest heroes uh, who respect authority. Um, this is this is what we want our children to grow up to be. And so this is uh, how the characters in the stories that we tell should also be represented as the good ones. Anyhow. OK, so that was censoring the content. Um, what do the characters do? How do they behave? Uh, there's an there's another aspect of censoring or preference here in terms of form. And the way that they talk about Greek stories at the time, poetry, is 
uh, two types. There's the kind where there's a narrator who tells the whole story and the kind that's acted out. A um, <clears throat> couple pictures here. So, uh, you know, on this side, you see the, you know, a Homeric uh, poet here with his, with his lyre, who is, uh, you know, just telling the, telling the story of, of events. This is epic. Uh, epic is closer to a novel. Um, you're just talking and relaying what happened. Versus uh, on the right, you see uh, a depiction of a, of a Greek theater. Uh, they're acting out, whether it's tragedy or comedy, uh, this is being acted out. Um, on stage. Now, which one do you think that Plato, or well, Plato or Socrates would prefer? Well, we've heard him rag on Homer a bit, but in this case, he is on the side of epic. Uh, that things, that it's better to have stories be told rather than acted out. Um, and so let's let's read here why uh, down in uh, 394e. What I want you to consider carefully, Adiamantus, is whether or not our guardians should be good at representation, meaning acting it out, or do you think the answer follows from what we'd already we've already established that whereas an individual can do one job well, he cannot do lots of jobs well. And if he were to try to do so, he would fail to achieve distinction in any occupation despite undertaking a lot of them. Well, of course it does. So the same sense of principle applies to representation or acting uh, too. It's impossible for a single individual to play lots of roles as successfully as he plays a single role. That's right. It would be unreasonable then to expect a single individual to work at one of the commendable pursuits and at the same time play lots of parts and be good at representations and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> The guiding principle in this theoretical, moral, just society of the Republic is that uh, people have a certain job and they specialize in that job and they only do that job. And because that job matches their nature best. And so they can be most successful at it and, and do the most good for, for the whole of society. This is... Um, this is a principle that's well, both uh, you know, communists and cap capitalists can agree on um, this sort of specialization, and what this has to do here with poetry is that uh, the idea is, I think, best summed up by the old stereotype that theater people are not to be trusted. Why? Because they play all kinds of different roles. They are liars in a sense and acting all these different parts. Um, <clears throat> so that lack of consistency in, in trying different roles is, is, means that um, they, you know, according to Socrates, can't succeed in any one. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this and and, and you might not either, and I hope you have some good objections for it, but uh, I just want to explain the logic of, of the thought is that in this world, you're going to have stable characters, uh, and then you, that's going to create, uh, you know, children who grow up with stable, good characters as well. Um, Plato will then um, go on to or Plato speaking through Socrates will go on to apply this to, to form more broadly in terms of different speaking styles, different rhythms of, of poetic verse and different kinds of music. He says, you know, again, less mixing, the better. Um, just like when he says with food, we don't want to have too many savory foods, not too many spices, not too many flavors. Uh, we want it to have it consistent. Um, you know, it should fit whatever type it is. And so, uh, you know, if you, if whatever, how, how characters should speak that should match exactly what their 
place in society is. So if, you know, if it's an aristocratic character, they're going to speak really well. If it's a, you know, if it's a servant's character, uh, they're not going to speak as, in as fancy a language. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a reflective of, of Plato's talk, thought in general, that everything fits into these separate categories. And this is the same, the same is true for uh, the characters should all fit in one kind of stable style. And in terms of telling stories, that it's better like Homer to have a narrator who tells it all in one voice rather than having to act out a bunch of things in different voices uh, because that mixing of styles, even though it can be more fun and more pleasurable, um, is not as good for specialization and consistency. Okay, um, he extends this idea in the chapter a little bit further uh, to visual and decorative arts. Uh, and I, I think you can get that just by reading uh, the first paragraph at the top here. It follows then that good use of language, harmony, grace, and rhythm all depend on goodness of character. I'm not talking about the state which is actual, actually stupidity, uh, but which we gloss as goodness of character. I'm talking about when the mind really has equipped the character with moral goodness and excellence. So there's a connection here from the moral, you know, kind of the inner to uh, the rhythm and grace and speaking, the, ex the external aesthetic qualities is what the, um, when they invent, invent the word aesthetic later, it, it, it's the body, the bodily qualities. So jumping down a little bit, he says, now painting and related arts and weaving, embroidery, architecture, and the manufacture of utensils in general, and also the physical structures of creatures and plants are all pervaded by these qualities in the sense that they may display grace or inelegance. And what he wants is elegance and grace. The fine arts uh, is elegance here. That fine means, you know, very thin or, you know, subtle nuance. Uh, that there's that there's finery is very well made, harmonious. I like how he ex explains it here on uh, the next page. And he's talking to uh, Glaucon here, who's who's in fact Plato's brothers. Glaucon, Adiamantus, and Plato are brothers, students of Socrates, and so here they are um, imagining things. Now Glaucon, I said, says Socrates, isn't the prime importance of cultural education due to the fact that rhythm and harmony sink more deeply into the mind than anything else and affect it more powerfully than anything else and bring grace in their train? For someone who is given a correct education, their product is grace, but the opposite situation is in elegance. Uh, so, you know, rhythm and harmony here are bridging this divide between uh, you know, the moral, the internal, and the physical, bodily, external. If you jump down to the bottom of the paragraph here, he says, uh, he's imagining, even when young, still incapable of rationally understanding why, you know, this well-educated person would rightly condemn and loathe contemptible things. And then when and then the rational mind would be greeted like an old friend when it did arrive, because anyone with this upbringing would be more closely affiliated with rationality than anyone else. So Socrates here believes that reason only arrives as an adult. You can't really teach reason uh, to children. You're not going to be teaching them logic. But what you can teach them is grace, harmony, rhythm, fine things, elegance, uh, by having, you know, this, this world of fine things that that's, in, that's a way to kind of prepare their character uh, to be well balanced and harmonious so that when they are adults then and reason arrives that, it, you know, it kind of functions. Uh, it's, it's fit, it's, it's set in, in that kind of temple of the body of the character. 
like an old friend. All right, one last uh, text piece of text I wanted to quote here from this chapter where he talks about harmony is, um, you know, what Waterfield chooses to con conclude the chapter is uh, he he's kind of steps back to look at the problem of extremes and what this might mean for different kinds of people who become guardians. Um, haven't you noticed the psychological effect of people spending their whole lives on physical exercise, but excluding culture or the effect of doing the opposite? Uh, he's just gone over the whole cultural, cultural side and then the physical side and talked about, uh, you know, diet and exercise. And to sort of conclude, he's saying, you don't want to have too much of one or the other. I mean, in respect of the brutality and intractability of the one lot and the softness and docility of the others. Yes, I've noticed that people, you know, this is, uh, this might be Glauk on here. I've noticed that people who engage exclusively in physical exercise end up being excessively brutal, while those uh, people who engage exclusively in cultural studies end up being shamefully soft. Um, and, you know, going down toward the end of the page, he says, so these two features have to fit harmoniously together. Uh, you want to be, he wants to have courage and bravery. Uh, this is the, this is kind of the physical component, but not so much that it becomes brutal and intractable that that doesn't follow orders or think about anybody else um, so that kind of sensitivity that gentility is the cultural side um, the emotional side but you don't want too much of it that they become overly emotional bookish uh, anxious uh, in fact he's looking for this kind of harmonious balance between the two which guides, again, you know, this, this sense of harmony between, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the physical aesthetic aspects of education and the moral in, in, interior aspects of it, and also this sense of moderation in general. Now to um, kind of close out this, this lecture, I'm, I wanna mention a couple uh, potential objections. There's plenty more out there. There's, there's so much scholarship on them, but I'll just give you a couple of, that came to mind for me in reading this. Um, so this chapter and the idea here, they're talking about education of the guardians, which is a specific um, class or caste in this, in this ideal republic uh, who are soldiers or uh, administrators, uh, the rulers. He's not talking about farmers, craftsmen, or the merchant classes, which is interesting. Like, is moral education not important to them? Um, so that's one, that's one interesting thing you might say. You, I mean, you, he might say, well, you know, censorship, censorship does, doesn't apply to those other, those other folks. They can figure things out on their own. Um, maybe not. Now, the reason that he says that education is so important for the guardians is because they need to judge situations. Uh, specifically here, he's talking about their, their role as, you know, protecting the friend, friends, protecting the, the neighbors and the countrymen and harming enemies. He compares it to a dog. Uh, that that can be both the best friend and you know extreme extremely harmful when it comes to an enemy. Um, that 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 you know for the dog, the difference is whether he recognizes you as one of you know one of our people or not. Um, so Socrates is building off of that to think about. Uh, the, you know, the importance of knowledge, the passion of learning that has to be key for these guardians, uh, whether they're, you know, soldiers or governors, uh, governing class. And the, 
contradiction in that is that earlier in the book, uh, I think it's from chapter one, is in a discussion, uh, it might be with Polymarchus, who says, oh, well, morality is where you, uh, you know, do benefit to, to your friends and family and you do harm to your enemies. That's what morality is. And Socrates says, no, 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 no. That's not what morality is. He, and he, he has this long argument, uh, which I won't go, to, go into, but at one key turning point, he says, can a moral person harm anyone? And he says, look at, look at a horse. If you, if you harm a horse, it deteriorates. Same, you know, uh, same with people. If you, if you do harm to them, they're, they're just going to deteriorate. They're not going to become moral people. Which is sort of a lovely, lovely criticism of the kind of negative motivation that, oh, you know, you, you, uh, you have to have harsh punishments for people who do wrong and that will, you know, negatively uh, motivate them to do right. Uh, Socrates in, in chapter one says, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you know, that will just f- cause them to deteriorate overall if you keep harming them. Uh, you have to you know, morality is all about, uh, all about being beneficial. So I point that out because there's a big contradiction between there and chapter one, he's saying, uh, you know, morality is not about this, you know, harm to your harm to enemies and good to friends. Morality is, is, uh, you know, doing harm to no one and, and doing good for all. Uh, but then that, that seems to perhaps be put in question here. Maybe not. Um, <clears throat> just another point I wanted to raise. And uh, so for all of this talk of moderation, there's a couple, there's a couple points where he, where he says, uh, you know, oh, well, see, so, you know, sexual, sexual pleasure is the most intense and, and therefore you know, the most dangerous. Uh, it can drive people crazy. So it should just be, you know, temptation should just be resisted. Uh, you know, the best, the best, point in life is when you get old and you don't have any sexual desire anymore. Uh, So he takes a very negative attitude that all sex should be repressed, um, which seems to go against this idea of moderation that comes about. So those are, you know, a couple different contradictions or or weak points that I I just wanted to press on a little bit uh, without developing a full argument. Okay, so this was just the first part of Plato's Republic, uh, dealing with chapter four when he's talking about education of the guardians and and depicting depicting characters who are ideal uh, to model good behavior for children. Um, We're gonna see in some later parts of the book that he's gonna raise some different criticisms about poetry that it's showing stories in general, and this is very much uh, an interesting question for movies. The problem is that the stories show appearance and not the absolute ideal, you know, not not the truth. They just show the appearance. Uh, So we'll take that up in the next lecture.